Good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting in 2023 of the Finance and Public Administration uh, Committee. Agenda item one is the economic and fiscal forecasts for uh, May 2023 and the medium term financial strategy. Uh, the first item on our agenda is to take evidence from the Scottish Fiscal Commission uh, on its forecasts and on the uh, MTFS. I welcome to the meeting uh, Professor Graham Roy, who is the chair. A Professor Francis Breeden, the com Commissioner, one Commissioner, and John Ireland, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. So before we move to questions, I'm going to ask a Professor Roy if he would like to make an opening statement. Good morning, convener, and good morning, committee, and thanks once again for the opportunity to come along <coughs> and speak with you this morning. And I want to give you a few reflections on our report and I, some key insights, I think, that we take um, from the latest economic outlook. So, on a positive note, we're now forecasting the economy will avoid a shallow technical recession that we predicted back in December, but the overall environment remains one of slow and fragile growth. Inflation has started to fall from its peak of around 11% and should still fall sharply this summer. However, inflation will continue to exceed the growth in nominal household disposable incomes, meaning that living standards are once again likely to fall in 2023-2024. Turning to our fiscal forecasts, the updates we made in May are largely incremental. Forecast revenue from Scottish income tax has been revised up because of higher employment and nominal earnings. By 2027-2028, the forecast revenue increases by £209 million. However, the offsetting adjustment to the block grant also rises, following similar revisions by the OBR to their income tax forecast for the rest of the UK. The end result is a small upwards movement in the net funding available to the Scottish Government. Now, we do continue to advise caution over the, high out, over the outlook for the income tax, next, income tax net position. From experience, we can see that revisions to the outlook are quite common. The underlying Scottish and UK income tax forecasts um, are very large in terms of their overall magnitude, so the net tax position is driven by very small differences between the two. As in December 2022, a divergence in earnings growth between our and OBR's forecast continues to be the main driver of the strong positive estimated income tax net position uh, for Scotland, particularly toward the end of the forecast horizon. And crucially, and we advise that if the Scottish and UK earnings growth turn out to be closer in the coming years, then that next net tax position is likely to be material lower than currently estimated. As we've highlighted in recent forecasts, we still expect a large and negative income tax reconciliation for the budget year 2021-2022. Comparing our and OBR's latest forecasts indicates a reconciliation of minus 712 million. Now, some uncertainty remains over the exact value and final outturn data will be available in July 2023. On Social Security, we've also revised up our forecasts, mainly because of demand for disability benefits being higher than expected. We also estimate that by 2027-2028, total spending on Social Security payments will be £1.3 billion, more than the funding received from the UK Government through the associated block grant adjustments. And it's important to know that one of the main drivers for this is the Scottish Child Payment, who forecast spending of £436 million in 2027-2028. Um, in December, I did caution that pressures from rising costs mean, would mean that the funding position for individual government portfolios would be challenging, and that assessment remains unchanged despite our marginally more optimistic forecasts. One crucial point we can maybe touch on in the questions is the uh, impact of inflation on the government's borrowing powers. So the borrowing limits set under the fiscal framework are fixed in cash terms and haven't changed since 2016. And we estimate that the financial power of borrowing has been eroded by almost 20% from the effects of inflation over that time. And then finally, convener, if I could draw your attention to the consultation paper on baselines that we published alongside our forecasts. And this might appear to be a dry technical issue, but it's important uh, about the assumptions we make about Scottish Government policy over the five years of our forecasts in the absence of a steer clear from Government. And we'll be speaking to a number of organisations over the summer uh, to discuss these points. We welcome your views too. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Roy. And I think we'll probably all have uh, a number of questions. So we're going to start uh, with myself. I think we've got about uh, 13 minutes each uh, or thereabouts for committee members. So, um, I mean, you, talk, you mentioned there the, the fact that your forecasts and the OBRs are uh, somewhat different from each other. And the, the, you also say that there's more uncertainty than usual at, at this particular time. So, 
why is there more uncertainty at this time and why this difference between the divergence, especially in earnings growth, between yourselves and the OBR? Um, <clears throat> so a couple, of, a couple of things I could say. So clearly, <laughs> clearly we, um, we've mentioned uh, in several times, I think all the times I've come to this committee, just the challenges that exist in the global economy just now, we're coming on the back of a, a pandemic, cost of living crisis, and the exact time path for the economy um, remains uncertain. There's some risks on the upside. So we've seen, for example, uh, an early lifting of COVID restrictions in China, which has helped uh, expand the global economy. But clearly, we've got effects of inflation still continuing to lag around, which are acting on the downside. Now, we have to make judgment calls about that, but clearly the, the world is uncertain at the moment until in, in the true effects of that feeding through to the overall, overall budget. And so that's the point about uncertainty on earnings, on earnings growth and uh, employment growth. So they're the key drivers of what the outlook will be for income tax uh, in Scotland and the UK. And as you know, under the fiscal framework, what really matters for the net tax position is that relative performance, that relative difference between the outlook for Scottish income tax and uh, the growth in the rest of the UK income tax. So that consequently means that what really then matters is the outlook for employment growth and the outlook for earnings growth in, in Scotland and the UK. And what we've seen over the last few years is a divergence there in, in between Scotland and the rest of the UK uh, on earnings and on, uh, on participation. And our judgment is that that gap will close over the, over the immediate term horizon. And we can maybe go into some of the details about why we think that is the case. Um, but even then, there's a judgment call that we make about earnings and a judgment call that the OBR make about earnings more, more broadly. And it happens to be the case that we are probably slightly more optimistic about earnings growth uh, uh, than the OBR are. Um, and that gets back to the point about one of the, 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 an important issue for the divergence. So we are forecasting, I think, if you turn to page 53 and 54 of our, of our report, um, where we have our forecast for earnings and there'll be our forecast for earnings. So we are forecasting around about, I think it's 2.6% growth in earnings um, over, the, uh, over, the, over the outlook of our forecast. The OBR are forecasting nominal earnings growth of, of just 2%. Now that's very low by historical standards. Um, if they revise that up to be more in line with ours and uh, they, they change that or we revise down because we are too optimistic, then that means that those d dynamics, the drivers of income tax, will, uh, will, be, will converge much more. And that's why the net tax position um, could, could decline toward the end. Because, I mean, traditionally we have found it hard to match the southeast of England and London, and their earnings have tended to be higher. So it's surprising to me that, you know, we've got this <laughs> uh, the other way around, in a sense, yeah. this time. So, I think, I was, Sam, I think so we, in a sense, the story is rather similar to what we went through in the last report, is that there are a couple of sort of pro-Scottish factors going on at the moment, one of which is um, what's going on in the, in the North Sea, that, that, that what we've seen for quite a long time now is the North Sea has been a drag because it's been a high-earning sector that's been sort of gradually diminishing. And actually what we're seeing, what we're, what we're expecting, and indeed what the data has been to show, is that actually the North Sea is not positive, but it's no longer a drag. It's, it's basically keeping up. So that, that, net, that, that sort of earnings effect is slightly reduced. The other thing that's uh, positive for the uh, Scotland is that um, rising interest rates tend to have a smaller effect in Scotland because the average Scottish person is less indebted than the average person in England. So, um, so that's the second factor. And the third one um, is that what we saw a very, very strong finance sector, in particularly in London last year, which really is a sort of bonus-related effect, which uh, is beginning to unwind already, so that the finance sector is not, and London is not outperforming the finance sector in Scotland by as much as it did last year. So, so you're right, I think that all of those factors together won't make Scotland's earning growth match that in London and the South East, but what it will do is make it match that is in England as a whole, and that's, and that's what we're sort of basing the forecast on, or slightly uh, go above uh, England as a whole. OK, thank you. Um, I mean, the big figure which you mentioned, which has obviously been uh, in the media and so on, is the negative income tax reconciliation of something like 712 million. Mm -hmm. So firstly, um, how certain are we about that? Because I seem to remember in the past that even late on, the forecasts with the actual outturn were quite different from each other. Yep. So is there a possibility that 
uh, we're just going to have to wait. And is it July? I think we're getting the final figures that mm -hmm. they could be very different from 712 million. So you will know in July the exact number which comes through. I think this time it's different, though. Uh, so clearly the forecasts, the 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 forecasts will you know are, are an estimate, and we'll get the exact number, and we can have the outturn data and compare them there. But if you recall, the reason for this 700 million difference was back to during the COVID times and the, the timing of the different forecasts. And if you recall, when the OBR assessment was made, which formed the BGA, that was done at quite a different point in the pandemic. It was at the time of where the Omicron virus variant was spreading around and the outlook for the economy across the UK was much more pessimistic. By the time the Fiscal Commission and the Scottish Budget did their forecast, in, in, in earlier, uh, well, er, later in the budget process, but earlier in the year, the outlook was much more positive. And it's the, it's the difference in timing and the difference of the assessments of the outlook. And if you recall back then, the, uh, the point was made, look, actually, there's a timing issue here, and that's likely to mean that the, 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 the BGA number will be revised up significantly, and that will be a key driver of the, of the, of the reconciliation. So um, in the past, the forecasts have changed because the because outturn data has differed, and that's just the nature of forecasting. This is more a fundamental question about actually when the judgments were made around the BGA and the tax position, and that's why the, 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 the number is so big and, and large this time. So in that context, you know, will it be 700 million? Will it be 650 million, uh, 600 million? I mean, we'll know in July, but I guess the key point is that we can be pretty confident that that will be a very large negative reconciliation because of the nature of the issue that's driving it. Yeah, just to, and also to add the point that we made a few times, which is even though it could get revised, it could get revised to be an even bigger number. I mean, you know, at this point, we don't know which way the revision will go. It could be, it could be an even bigger reconciliation, or be slightly smaller, it's equal probability, as far as we're concerned. Um, therefore, I think you know, it's it, you, it's you shouldn't. It's not a situation where you should ignore it just because it, the final number might be slightly different. Because I think this is giving, as Graham says, this is giving you a very strong steer that there is a big negative number coming, um, and even though the final number might be a bit different from the number we say, we could say it could be bigger than the, in, in practice. Okay. Mr Ireland, if you want to come in at any point, just jump in. And, uh, that's fine. Thank you. Um, I mean, your own uh, forecast in de December mm -hmm. uh, was, uh, compared to now, is that tax receipts have, uh, were, well, were 384 million less than that you're now forecasting. Um, can you explain quite why, why that was, why it's changed so much since December? In terms of the, the uplift in, in forecasts? Yes. So there are several things. So we, um, we've we got data. So what happens is we get new data all the time uh, coming through, and we've got new data on earnings across the UK. And actually what we see is that earnings data and income receipts that we're tracking are higher across the UK, and that's, uh, that's, an, up, that's an uplift uh, relative to, to where it was. We also get things like public sector pay awards feeding through, which again are higher than forecast in December. We've seen a much greater resilience <coughs> excuse me, in earnings as, as across the economy as a whole, which have all led to an uplift in, 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 in our forecast for tax revenues. And also that judgment we make about the slightly more optimistic outlook in the near term for the economy um, has, again, helped boost the revenues. Interesting, we don't actually... Have, we haven't actually changed our assessment of the economic outlook by the end of the forecast period. It's just that we, we think it's rather than entering a technical shallow recession, the outlook will be relatively flat, but essentially we'll have the same outcome uh, at the end of the five-year forecast period. Um, again, one thing I should say is that 300 million sounds a lot, but when we're dealing in the magnitudes of revenues that we're talking about of thousands of millions, then actually um, 300 million is a relatively small change in the forecast overall. Yeah, the problem is our borrowing limits are only uh, 300 million, so we'll raise yep. that with the uh, uh, Deputy First Minister next week. Y you mentioned data in there, and I just, mm -hmm. uh, how, how are you finding it now for getting the data you need on the time you need it? Because I know in the past that was a problem. Yeah, no, thank, and I appreciate you asking about that. So, um, yeah, we've we, I mean, we continue to work really closely with the key agencies that provide the data to us. Um, we, I think, mentioned last summer when we provided our statement of data needs that we had made good progress with the government, particularly on the economy data and particularly on the on tax data. Um, 
you'd be, you wouldn't be surprised to say <clears throat> we could always do with some more data and we'd always like some more information. Some of that is some of the challenges we have is just the limitations of, of, the, of the devolved context and the relatively small size of the Scottish economy in, in, in that perspective as well. I think the big progress we've made is, and it's still early days, is around social security. So I think that was our con big concern back in the summer. And uh, we've been working really closely with Social Security Scotland to, to get the information for them to collect the data in a way that's helpful. And also to have a really constructive relationship where we can essentially get their intelligence about what they're picking up as they're rolling out these benefits and new, and new payments. So there's still more work to do there, but I, I think we're relatively comfortable with where we are in terms of accessing the data. OK, and then the final question for myself. Uh, you say that in future years you do not currently anticipate any negative reconciliations or forecast errors after 24-25. Can you just say why you're, you think that's the case? So again, it comes back to Francis' point about what's the balance of it. So there will be reconciliations. Um, I, can I can guarantee you that. Um, but I guess what we're saying is at this moment in time, we don't see that there's a necessary... This, a necessary you know, case that it's definitely going to be a positive or neg negative reconciliation in that way. As I said, that brings us back to the 700 million figure. That was quite a different reason than just forecast error. This was the timing of when the forecasts were made and cautioned very much at the time, saying that, that the, the difference, particularly in the BGA that was embedded into the budget, was a, a significant underestimate of the actual reality. Of it. And that's why, uh, that's why we're pretty confident that the negative reconciliation that's coming will be large. So in some ways that was a one-off because of COVID and it was also turbulent. Yeah, and, and, and I think the reason for that, I think, is, was quite different. There is an interesting question about, uh, you know, that can happen again. And this comes back into the overall questions about how the fiscal framework operates. And, Having, ne having negative or positive reconciliations driven by when budget statements are, are made doesn't, you know, it poses challenges to it. I don't think anyone would say that's a, that's a good situation to be into where you're having to make financial decisions based upon timings of, of announcements. Um, but we will always have reconciliations. That's the nature of the framework. And these reconciliations, reconciliations could be large because uh, coming back to that point, you're dealing with, uh, you know, with thousands of millions of income tax revenues that are moving around. So uh, reconciliations and changes in the forecast of hundreds of millions of pounds are entirely possible, which comes back to your point about flexibilities in the fiscal framework to manage that. Okay, so thank it's, it's, it's worth adding that, that, that although the 700 is sort of a bit of a one-off because of the situation surrounding that, we're in a situation where, you know, the, say the, the reconciliation is the difference between two very large numbers, and both the numbers are getting bigger very quickly because of inflation. So, so we, we actually anticipate that in future reconciliations will get big, you know, will tend to be bigger than they have been. So, um, so although 700 was a, was due to special circumstances, we, we we're actually saying that a, a 700 of plus or minus is not something to be surprised of uh, in the future. Okay, thanks very much. Ed, so Douglas Lumsden's next. Camilla, just want to go back to the. Um the earnings um, growth. Obviously, the OBR figures are 2.0 and your own figures of um, 2.6 for, for Scotland. Um, you hinted that there might be some factors behind that you can maybe sort of expand on. So can you maybe do that, Professor Roy? A couple of things, if it's OK. I mentioned page 54 in our report, which talks about that. I, there's an interesting chart at the bottom there, which shows the relative difference uh, the relative comparison of Scottish earnings versus UK earnings and the long run average there. And what we've seen over the last five years or so is a gap widening between Scottish earnings and, uh, and UK earnings. And we think that part of that is the situation in the North East and the high value jobs in there. And that's been acting to pull down Scottish earnings relative to the, to the UK. Our assessment is that's not good, in, at least in the short term. We don't see that continuing. So the data we track shows that uh, that Aberdeen is at least not diverging. The North is not diverging in the same way as it has done from the rest of Scotland, and that means that that divergence isn't going to isn't going to continue. We think there'll be a, a, a relative catch up to some extent in the short term. There's longer term questions about the outlook there that is important. And Francis was saying there again about we've seen very high growth in financial services in London. 
which again changes the average and then drags uh, the UK away from Scotland. So that's some issues where we think, at least in the divergence, it's perhaps not going to continue to this in the same detriment to Scotland over the next uh, two to three years. There's a broader question, though, is about what is the judgment as economists looking across the economy that we, what we think might happen to earnings. And our judgment is that we think that uh, earnings will grow in Scotland around about 2.6 per cent. The OBR, making a completely independent, mm. different assessment, think it's going to be lower than that. Um, who's right? We'll obviously have to wait and see. But if they become more like us, or we become more like them, then the net income tax position won't be as strong because essentially what we're doing is assuming higher earnings growth than the rest of the UK and that will boost our revenues. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's not so much divergence, but we're actually, you're, you're predicting we're com coming closer again because, um, you know, 0.6 probably doesn't sound too much of a, a big number. But I guess what would that do if, if they did come together, but, you know, if OBR revised their figures back up to 2.6 yeah. growth, what would that do to our tax? Yeah. Income going forward. So, um, to the so the, yeah. So the, the the earnings piece is crucial to the income tax element. I can't remember, John. We do have a we do have a rule of thumb number we we talk about. Um, I'm not going to say it because because I'll probably have to write to correct it. Um, but we can we can give you the number there. But it's it's really you know so like a one percent swing in earnings is magnitude of. Hundred, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds. We'll get the exact number mm. for you, but it's it's really crucial to mm. that relative differential in, in in earnings, and that's where you see that if you look at what's been happening to the neg the net tax position, is shifting to net from negative to positive, is is driven partly by policy, but crucially by what's happening to the, the earnings outlook. Mm -hmm. So, how much caution should should the Scottish government <clears throat> use on this figures just now? When they look at the OBR figures, you know, obviously the, the average growth in earnings over the last 11 years has been 2.7 per cent, and now they've switched it down to, to 2 per cent. So how much caution should the Scottish Government give to, to this figure? Yeah, so we, we, and we, we explicitly say in the report that, particularly toward the end of the forecast period, that caution should be used uh, in, in that. I mean, I think we would hope that Scottish earnings growth would outperform the rest of the UK, and these will come through to tax revenues. But as I said, one of the, the crucial differences is our judgment relative to the OBRs is more optimistic for the outlook for earnings um, than theirs. And if that doesn't turn out to be true, so if it, we, we converge, then that net tax position will, will ease back down. So mm -hmm. that, and that's, that's the, the, the caution that we would advise. And, and when's the next um, milestone? When does the OBR <clears throat> publish the next estimates? So they'll be, the, they'll be in the autumn uh, to support the, the UK budget and we'll be doing the same around ours. So it's definitely something to watch. And, and I think when we you know, come back to when you'll see that, that movement in the net tax position mm -hmm. and, uh, and, yeah, and that'll be when we'll know more. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can just give you sorry. That, that sensitivity that um, we sort of ran some estimates, as Graham was saying. We estimated um, a 0.1 percentage extra growth in Scottish average nominal earnings relative to the rest of the UK leads to 25 million increase in the net, net position. Yeah. And that's on page 61 of the report. Okay. Yeah. So, the point, so, that you could, yeah, so a 1 percent would be 250 million, 0.6 would be 100 million. So it's, it's a significant it's mm -hmm. a significant number, and it builds over time. Yeah, but for the last five years, we've been lagging behind earnings for the rest of the UK. Yeah, and you and you see that. With, yeah, and you see that, and again, in the net income tax position chart, where government are trying to seek to raise revenues through um, changes in the tax, well, freezing the tax bans and increasing tax rates relative to the rest of the UK, but the actual amount of tax take coming in hasn't been keeping up with what you might have expected to raise, and the reason is because earnings haven't been as growing as, as quickly as the rest of the UK. Also, some issues around participation, and that means that the net tax position is perhaps not as good as you'd hoped it would be because tax base isn't as growing as, as quickly as you'd like. OK. Um, moving on to the next question, if I, if I may. Um, in terms of, obviously, the, um, the estimates you've been making of the government's spending, what assumptions, assumptions have you made are, are around the public sector workforce? Have you seen that number? Fall, uh, falling or staying constant? Well, so, I mean, so the, in terms of our in terms of our forecasts, what we tend to do in terms of the in terms of the spending outlook is that we 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 look at the, the essentially the overall funding envelope. So, what we look at is things like the block grant, the block grant, 
um, outlook for tax revenues, etc. So we don't really get into the details in terms of the specifics of the policy choices, which would include outlook for things like uh, employment and um, uh, 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 choices within that. So we're looking at the overall, the overall um, funding envelope, and, and that's driving that. In terms of when we had in December our forecasts for public sector employment and, and, and pay, um, can you remember that, John? You're not back to December, but we, each, each forecast, because we, we, we need to think about public sector employment and public sector earnings, we, we, do, we have a mechanical rule which operates. And that rule basically shows that the moment, in the May forecast, um, we're expecting the, the, the public sector workforce to fall by about 1%. So, um, but that, 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 that in, involves both the UK government's employment in Scotland, the Scottish government's employment, and the wider Scottish public sector, including local authorities, with local authorities being a, a very big driver. I suppose the contrast really is in, in, in terms of what the government has put into its MTFS, where they have a couple of scenarios which have got positive growth for public sector employment. But just to stress again that um, ours, ours just works off in a very mechanical way of, of public expenditure, um, sort of the, the likely pay pressures that the government talks about, um, and that just gives us a number for public sector employment. So, so looking forward, you don't have any estimates on the size of the public sector work? We, we basically say that it's falling very gently by, I think, about 1% over the next year, and that sort of trend continues, okay, which is... So so Which is in contrast per government. year, that's what I was yeah, trying to say. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay. an annual okay. okay. to John's point, which is it is very sort of mechanical, just runs off the funding envelope. You know, we're not forecasting it in a sort of, you know, in anger. It's just, it's just something that falls out from the process sort of thing. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, last question um, was around um, social, social security spend. Um, we've seen that go from, I think, about £3.6 billion in 2021-22. <coughs> it's going to be rising to, what's well, going to be Dublin. Um, by 27, 28. Mm -hmm. So behind that, I guess there's there's two things. Inflation is obviously pushing yeah. um, uh, the, the welfare bill up, but also I guess there is new welfare commitments that's that's not matched, that doesn't come through in the, the, the block grant adjustments. So how how much is it on each of each of those? Mm -hmm. And you know, if we never had these new commitments, what would the, the um, social social security bill be yeah. going forward? So there's, you're right. There's there's probably three big drivers going on to that. So first of all is in, is inflation, and with most of the key benefits uprated by uh, uh, CPI at key points, then a lot of the big increase we're seeing in social security uh, is coming through inflation. And we made that point in December, and that's one of the big drivers to it. The secondly is, is the increasing evidence across the UK about demand for key social security payments, particularly around disability payments and adult disability payments. We might come on to that post-COVID and some of the evidence that is being picked up around effects of long COVID and waiting times, etc. And that's driving it. Now, of course, in the Scottish context, both of these... You know, both of these um, at the margin are, uh, you know, lead to higher spending, but also higher funding. So that that's not a risk in that sense to the Scottish budget, um, because it comes through the block grant adjustment. Where the difference comes through is where either the Scottish government is introducing new social security payments, or where they're changing the benefit system that's being allocated, which leads to higher spending relative to the BGAs. And page 82 of our report. Figure 5.6 talks about those differences there, and we think that that difference between the amount of funding flowing through for Social Security payments and actually what the government are committing to spend is, is 1.3 billion by the end of the forecast period, um, and that's money that has to be found either from taxation or from other sources in the budget. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kamina. Thanks very much. Uh, so, Michael Mara is next. Thanks, Kamina. Uh, can I return to workforce, if that's okay? Are they the resource spending review um, said that we, the government was going to seek to return the size of the uh, public sector workforce to pre-COVID levels. Mm -hmm. um, and what you're saying is you've, you've not baked in any of those figures in terms of policy intent into your forecasts. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yeah, we haven't we haven't put anything specific this time into changes in is 
changes in employment forecasts. It's purely, it's purely mechanical yeah. in that context. It, it, it would be a, a major impact on the public finances if we were to take that trajectory that was the previous statement. I suppose we had um, the permanent secretary in front of us a few weeks ago mm. who stated that they were working on the assumption, or he was operating on the assumption, that that was the direction of travel, but that the government had made no new government under yeah. the new First Minister had made no specific statement. If there was a specific statement, would you be modelling that into your figures? Yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so we model specific policies on government employment or, and pay when we have the evidence to do it. I think, again, coming back to the answer to Douglas, I think we've got to remember what, what part of the fiscal process we do. So, for example, we would mod, the way it would come through to us would be as potentially changing our employment forecast, if we think that the government are changing employment levels. Um, changing income tax forecast, that's the way it would come through. Um, we would then think about how that might impact on funding. But when it comes to the spending bit, what we're essentially doing is looking at what's the overall envelope that the government will have, what they then choose to do that with, you know, allocating it either to public sector wages or employment or spending it on day-to-day -day services. That's not an area that we would typically go into because we were just looking at the overall totality of, of, of the budget. So, but in short, we would factor in if the government came with explicit policy of doing something, then it, we would we would take it as a policy that would enter our modelling process. Okay, that's useful. Um, the the government also in the um, medium term financial strategy has uh, established that, or is seeking to establish um, an external tax stakeholder group. Um, what do you <coughs> think the job of that body is? What, what does it have to do? I. Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, it strays out our remit um, it, because obviously what we do, we won't comment on policy uh, per se, and um, it's up to the government to come forward uh, with that. I mean, some general reflections, I think, on what I would what I would say about the overall reflections on on tax and the debate here, and I would say that the most important thing to look at is our long term work that we've done on the, the outlook for the budget. And we were here a couple of months ago talking about that. And for me, that, it, that's really important work to look at. What are the long-term structural challenges coming down the line for, for our public services in terms of the rising costs in health, the, the demand and, de and demographics, etc.? And I think there is a really important debate, not just in Scotland, but more broadly across the UK and internationally, about what does the public finance system look like for uh, public services that are going to be much higher demand are going to cost a lot more in the future. And that's where you start to get into some really interesting debates about tax. So for me, I think if, if, if I was... If, uh, one of the things I'm really interested to see from that group is, is what is the long-term... What what's the long-term evidence about the future of tax um, I, in, in the context of the changing nature of our public services? And are you doing much work on that then in terms of, so for instance, um, modelling on behavioural effects? Um, at longer term, given mm. where we are with the tax situation, the divergence from yeah. the UK. So our remit is quite explicit that what we can do is model uh, the specific policy choices of the government. So hypotheticals, then we wouldn't we we wouldn't be able to do that. That'd have to be done somewhere outside of of the fiscal commission. And um, we do work all the time on things like tax modelling and behavioural forecasts, etc., for the, to inform the process. And I would hope that our work might inform the thinking that might go on in a body like that. But if they come up with ideas and suggestions, etc., that wouldn't be for us to do. And that's just the nature of, the, of, our, of our framework that we operate of under. Of course, but you, you are doing that. Are you doing any of that preemptive work then, in terms of? No, exactly. I think that's a very, been a big part of our sort of research agenda, for, you know, since we've begun, really, to say, because it clearly uh, the tax situation is, well, not unique, but it's unusual in the sense that obviously the, the border between England and Scotland is extremely permeable and therefore that has implications for behavioural impacts of tax and uh, that's something we um, done some quite a lot of work on. We had an international conference because, as I said, it's not, even though it's unusual for the UK, it's a very common across the world. There are also countries with income tax differences across regions um, and we are, we have a, a body of work to look more and more in the Scottish case, but you know, as a sort of research economist, you'd say Scotland is still very, you know, as, as is often the case with economics, it's still too early to say, you know, it's the, the policies, the policy divergence between Scotland and England is still quite new. And therefore, I think the international evidence actually will continue to be a really important guide 
to to the Scottish experience. We'll do obviously do more and more work on the particular experience of Scotland. But as I say, at the moment, international evidence is is is, the, is very helpful because there are countries with a long-standing uh, period of, of different tax rates between regions. And what does that evidence tell you? Roughly that the the, the um, you, you know you, there is a, a, an impact, uh, but it isn't enormous in the sense that you are still in a situation where if you raise uh, particularly the higher rates, if you raise taxes, you still get revenue. It isn't the case that you, the, the behavioural impacts offset that. And, and that's you know, one extreme example of that is in, in the United States, where they have, some states have a millionaire's tax. Uh, and, you know, and there was a very strong view that you know, that millionaire's tax would just result in millionaires migrating from one state to another. But what the evidence shows, actually, most of the millionaires stayed put. And therefore, it did actually generate uh, overall revenue for, for, uh, in, in the United States. And so they say that's an ex right up at the millionaire's end. So you can see that even it's, uh, there, is a, there is a positive impact from these things. But of course, what it does mean is you don't raise very much revenue from, from raising higher rates, but you still raise some. OK. And uh, just to con conclude, how, how urgent is the work of the tax group, given, given the, the situation that we're, mm. we're facing and what's, what's outlined in your forecasts? Yeah. So I think, um, and we had it in the conversation about the long-term financial outlook. My, my personal view is that I think it is really urgent that we have the conversation about the long-term future trajectory of, of the public finances in Scotland. And this is not a unique challenge to Scotland. It's, it's common across high-income economies. But the, you know, these pressures are here and now, and you see that through the demand on public services. And they're only going to accelerate over the over the years to come. So I think having a conversation about tax, having a conversation about public services and reform, and how we grow our economy are are really crucial because um, big fundamental structural decisions are going to have to be made about how we can continue to protect public services over, over the over the long term that we all value. So I think it is urgent. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I would caution against quick solutions, and uh, here is a simple here is a simple thing that if you do this one thing, it, it's going to be easy. I think it, I think it's going to have to be a long process, but I don't think it should be. You know, you can make decisions now, and you can start putting in place the work that you need to do in order to to, to change. Okay, okay, that's good. Okay. Uh, Liz Smith is next. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, I've got two areas of questioning. The first is about the frustration that I think we all feel when it comes to the different timings of the forecasts that underpin, uh, whether it's a medium-term financial strategy or any other set of forecasts, um, and how the, the OBR and the SFC um, forecasts relate to the sort of different timings of the budget cycle. Um, and that obviously has an impact on uh, the projections that can be made given the data of that time. Do you think that there is scope to try to uh, bring these uh, forecasts, the timing of these forecasts, slightly closer together so that it makes it easier? I'm sure they will be on the SFC would welcome that as well. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of, in, 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 a, in a principle point of view, I think it, it, it does make sense to have the the, the forecasts from a purely technical point of view is being as close as possible. So we end up in situations like we had back in um, the, the COVID period where you've got a very fast moving economic environment, which then means that any delay between that means that the economic environment you're looking at looks quite different there. So in principle, yes, I do, I do appreciate that our forecasting is one part of a big budget process that takes place in Scotland and takes place in the UK and Par both parliaments need um, to, to proper time to scrutinise and, and, and do that. And um, I think it'd be, you know, clearly it's for us, it's really important um, that they're, they're together. Um, but it does avoid things like the reconciliations that, you've, that we've got just now, where a large part of that is simply through the, the timing of the publications. Yeah. And that can't be, that, you know, that can't be a good outcome. So now there might be ways you can get around that. So obviously things like, I think back then the government were offered a different BGA or a, a revised BGA at that point. So could you actually potentially do something different? That even if you've got a delay there, where there's a material difference in circumstances, could you think about, you know, changing the nature of the framework to be more flexible? So you've got maybe more accurate um, assessment from both. These are certain things which I think um, are definitely worth discussing as part of the review. And it, just in the discussions about the forthcoming uh, new fiscal framework to replace the 2016 one. Are, are you aware of any discussions about this forecasting uh, element? 
Um, so we're not part of these discussions, uh, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know that. I mean, we've been quite clear on the record about that's one of the things that we think should be looked at and, and could be looked at, but yeah, I, would, I wouldn't know where the, where the review was on that. Right. Okay. That, thank you. That's helpful. And um, secondly, on, I mean, there's obviously a very big uh, question to be asked about the both the medium term and the longer term uh, planning ahead for uh, the economy. And mm -hmm. You cited this in response to Michael Mara just now. The gap between Scottish government ex projected expenditure and the tax take. Is, a, is obviously a very serious issue, and that br brings our attention as a committee to two things. What scope is there for um, serious public sector reform that could help address this problem? And secondly, how can we increase the tax take? Could I just ask about the first of these, namely public sector reform? Do you have any suggestions to make about the most likely areas of public sector reform that could help, given that in health, in social security um, and in social care, there is almost certainly no scope for any reduction in spending? These are going to increase very substantially. In fact, I think your own um, estimates have already shown that. What scope is there for public sector reform that really could help that side of the equation? Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, I think getting into specifics about what government could do probably you know, strays out our remit in terms of suggesting policies in, in, in that. The general point that you make, though, if I can make some comments, I think it is really important. And I think this gets back to our long-term fiscal sustainability work, where we were projecting that health will start to take, you know, get up to the point where it takes over half the, the, the entire budget and coming through demographics, rising costs in there. So that's clearly one part of the budget that has to be looked at about, well, how can you continue to deliver the, the high quality health care in, in, a, in a situation where the costs of delivery and demand for that yeah. are, are going to get up? And from a purely economics point of view, I guess the key thing is that is, how can you essentially reduce lifetime expenditure per, you know, per head on issues like health? And that's not to say cut people's expenditure on health, but it's about getting into things like prevention so, um, and change, tackling inequality, growing the economy, so that you can actually, when the demand that people are using in the health service is actually be able to be, is, be reduced so you're not doing so much corrective um, activity you've done there. And, that, and that's not just unique to Scotland, that's what lots of countries are, are, are looking at. Um, there's obviously what can you do to actually become more efficient at delivery. Mm. Um, so I heard a fascinating talk yesterday from Gita Gopanath, who's the number two in IMF, talking about AI, artificial intelligence, how you can use artificial intelligence in terms of um, uh, detecting you know, cancers in people, about detecting uh, illnesses about using that to prov to um, to deliver certain types of treatments, etc. So, how can you use new technologies to deliver public services again, so you can reduce the cost on delivering these services in there? So, in many ways, this gets back to Christie. It gets back to the mm. stuff that this committee has discussed repeatedly about the need for reforms there. So, you're not changing the quality, but you're reducing essentially the cost that is uh, that is being is having to be paid in order to deliver that quality mm. service. And that's the areas that I think we need to focus on. Thank you. And, uh, you're quite right. You can't uh, make comment on uh, projected policies that the Scottish Government should employ. I'm just interested in whether, uh, as you um, bring together a lot <coughs> of uh, the analysis that you do and the data that you're using, whether you're aware of um, other countries and other attempts to try to um, reform public services in a way that you've just said about increasing efficiency or making use of technology or whatever. And, um, you've given us three or four examples in that answer just now. Uh, are there other areas that you think we should be looking at mm -hmm. without projecting into Scottish Government policy? Yeah. And so again, and come back to our long term uh, long term report, the areas we talk about are saying that there's, there's a number of different things that are driving what the outlook for the, the public finances. So one is obviously on the uh, on the spending side, so what can you do to essentially maintain the quality but adjust the spending profile? Second, what can you do in the economy? So what can you do to essentially raise the tax take in 
in Scotland, again, crucially in this framework, relative to the UK. So what can we do to outperform the UK to, to bring the revenues in there? Um, and then what can you do around migration? So what can you do about attracting more people to come to Scotland? Either that being taking a bigger share of international migration coming into the UK or attracting our UK people to Scotland. Uh, and again, crucially, to come in to create high value, to, to work in high value jobs that pay the tax revenues, because the nature again of this framework means that it's income tax revenues, particularly amongst higher earners, that really matters. Mm. And that's the different areas which I think are, are, are worth looking at. Mm. Okay, m my, my second uh, aspect of this is about <coughs> uh, tax revenues, just as you've said, and obviously that there are ways that which you can increase tax revenues by changing tax rates and thresholds, etc. But there is this question about the, the change to tax structures. And there's a debate going on down south just now about uh, whether inheritance ta uh, tax should be replaced, etc. And we've had lots of debates up here about whether council tax should change, etc. Again, going back to the analysis that you're aware of in, in, in other countries which have changed their tax structures, do you feel that that is a debate that is urgent here? in terms of trying to address some of the concerns that we have about a weakening tax return? Mm -hmm. A couple of things, and we would get Francis's thoughts as well. There's a, the first point to make is a really important debate globally about the future of tax and the nature of the tax system and what, and what we tax. And increasingly, if you're moving to a world where there's increasing value of capital in the economy, so increasing value of companies making profits through automation, through AI and less worker input, then how are you, how you taxing that? So that the, essentially if you're squeezing the amount of labour in the economy, how are you taxing capital efficiently in order to pay for the public services? And, and I think that's a really important global tax debate that's going on. And that's clearly getting into things like wealth taxes, mm -hmm. it's getting into corporate taxes, all of those sorts of things. And clearly in Scotland, we have a relatively narrow tax base in terms of its income tax and property taxes. And that's essentially it. So you, you don't have that broader spectrum in, spectrum in there. So any conversation that is happening about these broader taxes, then that has an impact about what you might want to do in the future around devolution of taxes and the like. I think in terms of the Scottish context, um, again, the nature of income tax means that what's so important is the, the growth in high earnings and what do you do around that? And that's where you broaden out. So less about, uh, it's about the volume of high taxpayers yeah. that you have, which, which really matters. And again, that's not a political comment. It's just an arithmetic comment about that's the way income tax that's the way income tax works there. And then the broader point is that the more you can grow that, that is crucial to underlying, creating the underlying revenues that will, will, will grow income tax. So the base is absolutely crucial and fundamental in there. So, you know, again, the government, they, they do some really helpful ready reckoners around income tax. So, you know, increasing the uh, higher rate, you know, 80, you know, one pence, 88 million pounds. Again, we're talking about the numbers there. We're talking about earnings, you know, 0 0.1 change in earnings, 25 million. So you can see that very small changes in the performance of your economy can have a really quite significant impact in your overall earnings base. And that's why broadening out that tax base mm. uh, is really important. And just to finish off on, the, on that <clears throat> point, when you had your um, breakfast in, in the Parliament um, some weeks ago, I think we focused on uh, the sort of high growth, potential growth areas of financial services, of renewables, of digital industries, technology. Are there other uh, areas of the workforce where you think mm -hmm. we've got more chance of widening that tax base and better higher paid jobs? Mm -hmm. So you're right. The, the, the nature of the economy is that you have sectors are naturally going to be more productive than others, and they're therefore sectors that are naturally high earning relative to others. So from an economic policy point of view, you can do one of two things. One is you can try and grow these high performing sectors in your economy relative to, to, to elsewhere, and that's why things like financial services, energy, you mentioned renewables, 
etc., are all really important because they are naturally highly productive sectors, which will then generate the, the broad tax base that you want. That's not to say you should also think about what can we do to boost productivity in the other sectors in the economy, so things like hospitality, things like um, uh, you know, care, public services, etc., because if you can make them more productive, then they will actually improve their earnings as well. So it's riding the two horses there. So one is about attracting and growing the, the high productive sectors, and the other part is how you can actually make other sectors in the economy more productive. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Liz. And it's Michelle is next. Uh, good morning. I think that leads quite uh, neatly onto the area I wanted to ask about in terms of capital uh, expenditure. <coughs> uh, I mean, we know that the block grant funding from the UK government is the largest component of the Scottish government's capital funding. And your projection suggests that it's going to be cut in nominal terms by 14% between 2023-24 to 2028-2029. So my question is... How will this cut, in your view, affect the productive capacity of the Scottish economy? Mm -hmm. In what ways? Yes, yeah, so you're right. On page, I think it's page 18 of the report, we talk about the outlook for capital spending. Um, so it just it's a 14% cut in real terms um, oh, that, that, we're, that, we're, that we've got there. And you're right; it's the it's the the block grant is driving that. Um, in terms of our forecasts for what we think about is happening in the economy. Um, broadly speaking, the way that we capture changes in capital spending and the economic outlook is largely just an arithmetic exercise. It's just a change in spend. So we don't capture in our short term, in our medium term, sorry, medium term in our five-year forecast, we don't capture the change in productive capacity from that. We, we don't alter it. It's just money in, money out, uh, and reduction in that. But you're right. The broader question is, what, what's the long-term benefits of the capital expenditure that you're that you're coming from that. We've not made an assessment of that, not in this report, because I said it's just simply, it's just an accounting exercise that we have in terms of the money coming in and out. But uh, clearly, you know, cuts to capital expenditure have an impact on the long-term okay. productivity. So if we can explore that a bit more, perhaps then if you could, all of you as uh, top-notch economists, just help, and perhaps for the record, how productive capacity can be affected by low levels of capital expenditure. And I'm thinking things around, you've talked about AI, <clears throat> R&D, productivity mm -hmm. itself, economic growth, sustainable well-being or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Can you just give a flavour of the real impact of whatever figure, whether it's for a 14% cut that we know in real terms or otherwise? Because I think that would be useful for the record. Mm -hmm. So, um, broadly, how capital expenditure can impact on the economy? Essentially, it, it, it means that you can, uh, you can produce more output for the same amount of effort, uh, broadly speaking. So things like transport infrastructure gets you to me to be quicker. That makes you, be, you, can, uh, you, can, you can do more for the same amount of effort that's going in there. So particularly things around transport in infrastructure have a direct impact on productivity. Things like education infrastructure, they're much longer term uh, and real benefits over the, over, over the medium term there. So if you can improve the quality of schooling, you can improve the quality of physical infrastructure around that, then the benefits for that will be marginal, but will build up over time uh, into that. There are obviously some parts of capital expenditure that might have less of an impact that the government might do that on productivity. So if it's, if it's a particular government building or if it's, if, if it's a, um, you know, say a prison or something like that, then we naturally wouldn't maybe capture that in terms of, of productivity there. But um, it's crucially about how can you actually just change the productive capacity largely by uh, improving the way the economy operates. And, and historically, that's where one of the things the UK has lagged behind as a whole, you know, key competitors. <laughs> Uh, and that's one of the potentially long-term expl uh, explanations for the productivity puzzle in the UK relative to other countries. Actually, you've already uh, prompted my next question. Do you have any, off the top of your head, I appreciate, uh, comparative figures of how UK, say, perhaps in the last 10 years, capital investment compares with other states? I don't think it's anything that we've, that we've looked at. Uh, Francis, do you know anything from no. comparison? And also to say that, yeah, I mean, I think... 
I mean, there's obviously a big difference between private sector and public sector investment here, which mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think. And, and it, yes, it, it, it also obviously varies because there are countries with much bigger public sectors and, and to start with. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so that's me just saying really no. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. Well, some of the people going to yeah, yeah. the committee on. And, yeah. Um, but it's one of these, I mean, it's one of a number of factors that people have speculated about, you know, why the UK productivity has potentially lagged behind is mm -hmm. it's a bit of, of, of um, a capital investment, particularly in connect, connectivity, digital infrastructure. So again, you can compare digital infrastructure in the UK versus the best Scandinavian countries and you can see the difference. And you've got all the other explanations like management practice and the like that potentially explain the productivity piece as well. But it, Capital investment is crucial in the long okay. run for investment. Uh, and so following on from that, <coughs> um, you indicate that you know, the Scottish Government may receive further funding from other sources than the block grant. What are they and what do you see as the key risks for them not materialising? In other words, I'm trying to flesh out uh, how m the extent to which they can be relied upon relative to the block grant, which we know has got this significant cut. Yeah. So we talk about page 34, we, we talk about the different uh, elements of the outlook for capital funding. The government, obviously, you mentioned, get the key chunk from the block grant. That's the most important element. Um, they can obviously borrow as well. Uh, and we talk a bit in there about the constraints on borrowing and, and mm. potentially hitting the, the limit. Um, there's a really important point about the erosion, the effect of inflation, eroding the amount of limit, mm -hmm. the amount of money the government can, can borrow, and the fact that they've been fixed in cash terms since 2016, and you've got high inflation, mm -hmm. and it, the amount that the government can essentially add in to that is, is constrained. Uh, and in the other funding we talk about, we talk a bit about things like um, uh, city deals, so potentially future city deals that might come down the line, which might lead to additional capital funding that would be outside the block grant. That's a potential source of funding. Of course, that's, that depends on policy choices at, at the UK. And, and then what the government might do with the Scotland Reserve as well. So money they're putting in there, moving from one year to the next. That's where potentially they can try and offset some of the mm. potential f uh, outlook of the negative outlook in the block grant. I think your, your, your contention is correct <coughs> that the block grant is, you know, dominates that. It's really, that's where the money really comes okay. from. Okay, and therefore any cut in that yeah. block grant yeah. has potentially a significant impact. My last week question then, just to, to finish off, it strikes me that uh, because of the limitations instilled by a fixed budget, the, the narrative is continually about revenue spent, for very good reason, of course, it needs to be scrutinised and monitored, without the same necessarily awareness in the kind of body politic, if you like, of the implications of capital expenditure and in investment terms. Is that something that, as, again, as economists, you see happening almost as an inevitable consequence. I can see your uh, nodding. I think it's, I mean, it's a very common issue internationally. So, that, you know, that you, when, when budgets are tight, capital spending looks like a very easy, easy cut because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mm -hmm. create as much immediate pain as cuts in other areas. But of course, it, as your questions are implying, it, it doesn't create immediate pain, but it has these long run consequences that you, you, you have to pick up later on. So I think that is sadly a common uh, feature that, that that's what, that, what, what, what governments tend to do in, in these sort of circumstances where, where money is tight, capital seems like yeah. a, a good place to start. And is it even more prevalent in Scotland because the tendency is to focus on revenue because of the fixed budget? Um, possibly. I mean, I think the fact that you're raising capital, I think it is a really important point and we need to mm -hmm. think about, you know, what we do about the capital budget and the allocations there. Is it Scotland? I mean, I think I remember back to maybe 10 years ago when there was a big debate about capital investment and it was all part of the government acceleration programme post the financial crisis and there was a big debate and discussions mm. around the value of capital investment and trying to accelerate that and shovel-ready projects and things. So I think there is an under I think there has been an understanding about the value of capital. Um, I know the government do the infrastructure investment plan and set out how they how they expect the capital budget to feed through to these outcomes. But you're right, and I think again this comes back to the conversation with 
um, with, with uh, Ms Smith there about the, the long term, what we're doing to prepare for these long term challenges. So you're right, productivity is one element and that's where the capital budget is really crucial. But what are you investing in the public services through your capital budget to help you take advantage of, of the investments that you make now for offsetting some of the long term challenges you've got down the line? So, um, yeah, the more that you, more you, you want from us in capital and understanding of that, the better. One okay. happy to help. Well, good. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I, mean, I, Thank you. That, I mean, particularly your question about it being an issue with Scotland. I mean, it, in a sense, that your, your, your previous questions shows it isn't that much because, in a sense, the block grant is so dominant in, 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 in what the, the capital spending envelope is. Then, in a sense, uh, you know, Scotland is spending up to its envelope in, in capital and it's the block grant that's driving that. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Keith Brown's next. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, good morning. Just to say that my questions might be a bit naive and all over the place. I'm a new member of the committee, but um, I was just interested in the point that um, about inflation uh, leading to slightly lower expectations for inflation and interest rates in the near term. And just from what I observe, where core inflation has actually increased, I think to 6.8 per cent, and most commentators think that we're going to get at least one, probably two more interest rate increases, the effect it's already having on the housing market and the mortgage rates. How, how confident, or, or have you got a time scale for when you expect to see that reduction mm -hmm. in inflation? I think we were told last year it was going to be the middle of this year when yeah. we see that reduction, but that's not yeah. happened. So that I, so I'll go first and then Francis, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Francis can uh, come in. Uh, you're right. So what, the big story in town is what's happening to inflation and, and the effects of, of, of that. And uh, the first thing is that inflation will come down quickly over the next few months simply because of the way it's calculated. So it's looked at from one year, one point in the year to the previous point last year. And because we had the spike, it will, it will naturally come down. The key question and the key point that you're making, which is really crucial, is you know, how quickly will it come down, but crucially how embedded any expectations about inflation will be over the, over the next uh, year or so. And that's where the, that's where the, concern, the potential concern that's being raised with, amongst people is that it, that it will come down quickly, but will it, will, it actually, um, will it actually level off and be at a higher rate? And if that happens, then the Bank of England will have to be more aggressive at trying to increase interest rates in order to bring inflation down and that's and that's where it gets challenging for the economy because essentially the only way you can the only they face a really difficult trade off between slowing the economy to try and combat inflation but then not trying to tip the economy into into a downturn. Um, and yeah, and that's we just need to wait and see and, and hope we get it right over the next few months. I, mean, I think I think it's I mean it's sort of been a really odd combination in the sense that the original culprit behind this inflation energy in a sense has actually come down way faster than we were originally predicting so <laughs> without that we, we you would have thought we would see this inflation falling more but in fact what we've seen is that the that, that burst of energy prices we got last year is still working its way through every single other price the you know food prices everything um even though the actual energy price itself has fallen so so that's one of the many reasons why we think the fall is happening because for example, I mean, we, we're getting the price cap revised in July, and there will be a big fall in, in energy bills, well, a fall in energy bills uh, in, in July, and another one potentially in October. So we sort of know those negatives are coming. But, you're, but, you, but as your question implies, that you know the core has been surprisingly mm. resilient, given that we would have thought the core inflation would have come down faster than it has. Yeah, I can't say I've seen any evidence in my own bills for a reduction in energy costs so far, to be honest. But, um, and I suppose that's the important point. It's what people are actually having to spend that's going to have an impact on inflation. Just taking two or three things together, um, Michelle Thompson's questioning about capital, a 14% reduction over the next few years. I think it says somewhere in your report that living um, standards are taking one of the biggest hits and are projected to take one of the biggest hits that we've we've ever seen. And on the revenue side, it's a pretty small increase over the next uh, few years. You've been asked a number of questions about comparative, comparative in relation to taxes. This, which could be described, and I'm not asking you to do it, as a kind of austerity uh, period again going forward. Is there any comparison that's been done in relation to following this kind of austerity policies? Which are odd, given that national debts ballooned to two and a half trillion pounds. But these austerity polls are working uh, for the ends which were set out, or are other countries following a different path 
which is more productive? Uh, is there any comparative studies which have been done in that? Uh, so it's not something we've looked at to compare in to that context to what everyone else is doing. I, I think the the general comment I think I would make is that, and we we just spoke about this back in December. The real challenge, so the real challenge of inflation is the essentially the hidden effect it has on living standards and the power and and spending power of government. And that's why even though we've got really fast earnings growth in cash terms, that that's being offset by the really high in, in inflation that we've got there. And that's why we think that living standards will fall uh, this year uh, on the back of falling last year. And that then is feeding through to government. So even though, the blo even though government is spending more money and increasing government expenditure um, quite substantially, that's being offset by the high effects of inflation. And that's why tackling inflation is so important and getting it back down to a more comparable level so you're not essentially in this constant cycle of erosion of the actual spending power. Uh, they, uh, in the, uh, and then in the Scottish context, what does that, that means in terms of ro eroding the things like borrowing powers, the effectiveness of the, of the borrowing powers. Um, if, it all, if it all works out correctly and we get inflation back down, then you can start to get back onto a more normal path where you know, more standard earnings growth can actually lead to, an, lead to improvements in living standard because it's growing, it's growing ahead of inflation. We, we still expect that will happen, so we still think that, we think that um, it, disposable incomes will start to increase next year. Uh, it will take a while to come back to where they were pre-energy uh, uh, crisis levels. Uh, and the same for government expenditure as well, that government expenditure will start to rise again in real terms. Um, but clearly, government within that overall envelope has got really big pressures around rising pay costs and, and, own, and cost of delivery of services as well. Yeah, just on the earnings, we had a discussion earlier on about comparative uh, rates in Scotland projected with the rest of the UK. Um, it would be useful to know what, if there is any comparison with Scotland with the rest of the UK, excluding London. <clears throat> and also, there was no mention at all, which I was kind of surprised at, or maybe I am just getting this wrong, of comparatively positive performance in Scotland in terms of employment itself, whether it is yeah. employment, unemployment, or even now, for the first time, I think, economic inactivity, all of which have been well ahead uh, of the UK for a number of months. That mm -hmm. would surely have an impact on your... Is that part of your calculations, yeah. in fact? Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of things. You're right. So the um, comparison between Scotland and the UK, one of the, one of the, one of the slightly unfortunate things in the nature of the fiscal framework means that the focus is always on Scotland versus the rest of the UK. And actually, when you start to unpick that and you take out London and the South East, you get quite different stories about how Scotland is doing from an economic perspective compared to other parts of the UK. And we know, you know, we know from all the data that Scotland outside London and the South East typically comes in next in terms of rankings on most economic indicators. Um, that being said, on the nature of the fiscal framework means that what, what matters and what we're signed up to is that relative performance of Scotland and the rest of the UK, including London and the South East. So that's why we focus on that, uh, on that so much. Um, and that's why it matters for earnings. On the, the point about the labour market and uh, employment levels and um, uh, inactivity rates, one of the things that we have seen in recent years, and this is over the longer term, so this is just the most recent stuff, is that um, there has been a decline in participation between Scotland, a uh, decline in you know, challenge in participation between Scotland and the UK, and some of that is demographics. But there's something which we, we've, we have a, quite a big discussion in the, in the report this time, um, where we look at changes in inactivity and the, and the difference in data that we're getting in terms of um, uh, levels of activity between Scotland and, and, and the UK. And one of the things that we, we're not sure of yet, and we just need some more data to see it a bit more, um, is that while both Scotland and the UK have got declining participation because of age, Scotland hasn't kept up with the UK in terms of participation amongst the key age bands, so particularly in the middle of the, uh, the middle of the demographics. Now we don't really know why that's the case. It might be a data issue. It might be issues tied to the northeast, etc., um, and you know the, the loss of jobs there um, since 2014. But that's something which I think we want to really keep an eye on. Just that differences in participation in, in, in the midpoint in there. So we have quite a bit of discussion in there, and we talk a bit about some of the data in there, which basically concludes that we're not sure yet. 
Last, well, I can just ask if you've got any data on FDI compared to the rest of the UK, excluding London, just Scotland's relative performance. But also, and this betrays the fact I've not been involved in these discussions previously, but the discussion which we've had around the reconciliation of 700 million, yeah. just to get, try and get my head around it, is what you said earlier on, um, basically saying this is down to a timing and forecasting situation. It's not due to as best I can tell, and tell me if I'm wrong, any decision of the Scottish Government or any financial um, act of the Scottish Government. Obviously, that will follow on from the forecasting, but initially it's a forecasting situation. And just to say that the idea of any consistency in when you can do your forecast seems undermined by budgets changing every year or not taking place when expect. It's not like it used to be in the 80s and 90s and even in the zeros where you knew when the budget or the autumn statement was going to happen. It's all over the place for the last few years. But it would be interesting to know if that adjustment, that £700 million, to what extent is the Scottish Government responsible for that? Mm -hmm. A couple On FDIs, you mean foreign direct investment? Yeah, yeah so we track things like... Uh, data on in, uh, foreign direct investment and investment levels on that. And there's, broadly speaking, there's two sources. So the government published data on business investment, etc. And we track that, which has actually done quite well over the last year in, in, in Scotland. So we track that and that gives us a broad sense about how the economy is doing. There are also more unofficial estimates that we get. So uh, EY's attractiveness survey, etc. And that gives us an idea about, again, how Scotland's comparing relative to the rest of the UK, and that all goes into the mix when we make an adjustment, when we make our assumptions about the forecast and go in there. So if, for example, we saw lots of data showing significant investment in Scotland and high earnings growth and lots of jobs being created, then that would be something that would be factored into our forecast. Um, they're probably the two main sources that we would use, and that, that is something which enters into it. In terms of the reconciliation, uh, there, again, a couple of things just to mention. So this is reconciliation for 21-2022, and our latest estimate is that we think the net tax position for that year will be negative. So um, the block grant adjustment will run ahead of where the income tax receipts were. Um, the reason for the big reconciliation is down to differences in forecasts. So that's not about um, you know how the economy is performed you know, at, at the time. It's just about what the assessment was made back in, I think it was, was it December 2020 for the OBR or November 2020 for the OBR and then a uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission in January 2021 um, or early in the spring. And if you remember back to that point during COVID, so the, the end, you know, Christmas period, you know, in the run-up to the Christmas period was when the new variant was coming out. There was real concerns about the outlook for the economy and it was all, you know, it was really quite it was really quite uncertain and negative. Jump forward to when the Fiscal Commission were making their forecasts in the in the early spring, it was when the vaccines had come out, you know, there was at least a time pass getting through this. So the overall outlook was much more was much more positive. And it's that difference between it. I think we've got a we've got a table on um page eleven which uh looks at that and if you so if you see um when the BGA was set in uh, the budget setting process, it was saying that the block grant adjustment would be at 11.8 billion. The latest forecast is that's 13.6 billion. Whereas when the Fiscal Commission was making its forecast on income tax, it was 12.2 billion. And, and now the latest position is 13.4 billion. So the net, the income tax has gone up by a billion, but the block grant adjustment has gone up by 1.8 billion. And it's the difference between the two that leads to the reconciliation. And you can see that in terms of economic performance, they both have gone up, but it's because of the timing of the BGA was in a much more pessimistic period. It's gone up by even more, and that leads to that leads to the reconciliation. Yeah. And just to reiterate the point of info, though obviously the, the timing of the two forecasts was a factor in that case, I don't think we should think of that scale of reconciliation as being something that as a one-off that we won't see again. I think that's something that... that, that we should consider that as the sort of scale that we will, you know, we would expect to see. So, um, so yes, although there were some rather special circumstances of getting around that number, I think just growing budgets mean that that's the sort of the ballpark we should be thinking of. Thank you. Okay. And Ross Greer. Thanks. Come here. Mm. I've got a couple of questions about the calculations around social security spend in figure 5.3, which is on page 81 of your 
paper. I um, appreciate just a, a little bit more information. Just on the um, Scottish child payment in particular, obviously part of the theory of that is give families more income, create the stability for the situation for them to then uh, find themselves in a better financial situation where they don't require um, the, the child payment. The calculations you've got here show that um, dip over the next couple of years, but that then slowing down um, somewhat over the, uh, the last couple in the cycle. Could you explain a little bit about that tailing off in the decrease? <clears throat> so, so you're talking five point three. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's uh, the that's largely due to um, changes we made in our assumptions around um, take up and uh, the difference between um, eligibility and caseload, and we were we were essentially assuming a higher take up early on relative to um, the end of the forecast period. The data that we have show that take up is ever so slightly less in the uh, just now than it potentially could have been, but we think that it will we think that it will essentially accelerate and catch back up. And that's why the gap is bigger just now, but it will ease off toward the end. We also think that the actual number of eligible children is, is less than we were expecting back in December. So in turn, that reduces how much we think will be spent. How much of that, the reduction in number of el eligible children, how much of that is a reduction in overall population versus the relative socioeconomic situation of the children? Because I think over the period that, um, the, the five-year period uh, f for this paper, we're looking at something like a drop in 25,000 yeah. children in the primary school role. Yeah. It, so one thing I'd say is that we're still, this is still very much us seeing the data coming through and making judgments on the back mm. of it. But one of the key dominant features for eligibility is that change in pop projection for child population. And it's, it's less than what we were thinking it was when we were first making these forecasts. And on the um, child disability <clears throat> payment, we'd have expected a significant initial spike as we transition to that, away from quite a relatively hostile DWP system towards a deliberately more generous Social Security Scotland system, but the projections for the child disability payment in the same table continue to, to rise quite significantly. And I understand why that's the case for adult disability payment, where you know, our adult population is becoming more ill as a result of a, a number of factors. Is that the same driver behind child disability payment, or is it something else? Uh, it's a mixture of both. So we have seen higher inflows into child disability payment uh, than the previous benefits there. So um, part of that is us projecting essentially higher demand coming through as uh, uh, you know into the, into the into the future, and some of that's linked to the economic situation, and uh, some of that's just linked to the higher demand that we're seeing in terms of children coming forward for and being eligible for these benefits. Yeah, there's about uh, one third um, of the the increases down to sort of UK wide trends, and the other two thirds to the launch of the new payment. Right. Thanks. Um, and on a different note, away from, from that table, um, Francis, you mentioned it towards the, the start of the session about the, the North East over the next couple of years no longer being quite as much of a, a drag on the Scotland-wide income growth figures. This committee took some evidence, I think it was late last year, on regional differences in income growth. And the really stark difference was East-West. Um, and that's reflected in population figures as well. All the local authorities across the East Coast are projected uh, to grow, whereas Argyll and Butte and Rakhide have got the, the most significant um, decrease. How much of that um, regional data are you able to, to draw out for the purposes of this projection? Yeah, so we, we're looking, so this is one of the useful things you get from this RTI data. We, 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 we can get regional data and regional incomes. Um, and I think we've, we're very focused on Aberdeen in that area because what we've seen historically is that's the sort of, that's the outlier. I mean, yeah. in, you know, so Scotland, in fact, Scotland as a whole, it tends to have rather similar earnings growth and indeed that earnings growth tends to be rather similar to the, to the rest of the UK, whereas uh, Aberdeen in that area is, 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 is a variation. So we've really, so I think that's one thing we've, we've seen is, you know, is, is important in understanding obviously what's the key part of our forecast, why Scottish earnings Diverge and, and already in the what's interesting in the data that we've seen is that um, uh, the Aberdeen area, which is for a long period now has had slow earnings growth than the rest of Scotland, on the latest data is is up with the with the average of Scotland. So that's sort of in line with our story that actually the, that that area will no longer be a drag. Although, as Graham rightly pointed out, how long that continues is you know is really hard to judge at this point because 
we still think that the North Sea is obviously a you know, mature and declining sector, and therefore that long-run trend is there, but we're just obviously seeing a, a period now where, that, where, where there's a bit of a, uh, a well, mini renaissance in that area because of what's been going on in energy prices and the rest. Is the West potentially going to become that drag? Are we going to continue to see a, a gap? The, are we going to see the gap continue to grow between uh, earnings and East and West? Because we saw that some concerns around that coming out. Certainly, I've heard them locally um, off the back of the Freeport announcement. There's going to be one in the North, one in the East, but not in the West, where we're already seeing. Not that I'm in favour of Freeports and stressed out, but um, <laughs> that we're already seeing this issue of um, not just a fallen population in the West Coast, but a fallen in average income relative to or fallen average income growth compared to the rest of the country so that that's been a long as you mentioned that's been a long-term trend in scotland for the last 20 30 years is particularly the shift east and the mm. growth of earnings etc in the east and part of that's a sectoral mix particularly financial services and energy over in the east which is which has grown there um, the i guess what what matters now is what happens going forward because that's all baked into the baseline so the yeah. fact that earnings in, in the west for example are slightly lower than than the east then that's, into that, that, that's made from the initial adjustment. What matters is what kicks on from there. And that's where that relative performance is, is really important. As you were asking your question, I've got a really, I've got a really good chart that basically uh, answers your question. So, uh, but it's probably not great for the public record just to show it. <laughs> um, so, but we can write and show you that. And that just shows you the Thanks. difference between UK and Scotland and the gap that's emerged, but just the crucial bit of Aberdeen and the North East in there, and that actually helps explain quite a significant chunk of it there. And what matters is, is going forward from that. And as I brought up the free ports that occurred to me, have you projected anything on the basis of the expected economic impact of the free ports? I um, realise it's very early in that process. No, so. a, I think we'd need clear policy about what that would be. And, a, and the question for us is, would have a material macroeconomic impact over the course of the five-year funding horizon that we look for. We need to make a judgment call about whether that would be that would be the case or not, and what displacement and dead weight would be associated with it. So, um, and final point um, around the, the availability of data, and this may be string outside your remit somewhat, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on it. Um, obviously, you have access to significant amounts of, of public data that's not otherwise in the, the public domain. But if we look at things like some of the um, independent tax proposals that have been put together, the paper that the STC commissioned, um, for example, there's quite a significant difference between the additional revenue that they're saying would come from some of their tax proposals versus yeah. what's in the, the ready reckoners. Um, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on whether there is enough information in the public domain to aid a healthy public debate, mm -hmm. because it creates a bit of tension, obviously, where the STC say that you know putting 2p on the top rate will raise an additional yeah. 200 million, and the ready reckoners say it will be essentially net neutral. Yeah, a couple of things. I think again, you'd expect to say the more information that's out there, the better, and the more accessible. There are actually really good tax models out there, so Scottish Parliament have access to things they can do calculations around this. So I think on on the basic tax policy choices, that then I think there is capability for people to do that and set it out so that's the first point the second point comes down to i think there's a lot it comes down to you know, what might be the behavioral changes yeah. that go into that and we have quite rigorous and quite open and transparent marginal tax and behaviors that will come into all of that um, and they have material impacts on the end outcomes so I guess the question is, are there people with other numbers out there, are they doing that? Are they talking about the static effects? Are they talking about dynamic effects? And that's typically where the big differences uh, dig. I think it's worth well. adding also that, you know, even if you get all the data you, you, you know, ideally want, you also, the other thing you want is a, is a relatively long run of it to, to actually do economic analysis on. So I think a lot of these questions for Scotland are still relatively open because we've actually got a rather short run of, of data to look at. And, and as I said before, in terms of this, behavioural impacts, you know, we are, uh, the, the Scottish data is really, you know, we're, we're obviously going to do as much as we can with it, but that's why we've historically lent more on the international evidence where there's a, the, the data is, is, is probably the same as Scottish data, but it's just a longer run and it's been in, in analysed in, in, can be analysed in more detail than we can currently do with Scottish data. We, we don't use that much private data. One of our general principles is we prefer to use publicly available data because it increases transparency. And there's not a lot of private data floating around in this area, so it is mainly public. Thanks, Roch. That's all from me, Convener.
Thank you very much. Well, can I congratulate both the committee and the witnesses for uh, keeping us to time? And we've done quite well, thank you. There, is there anything else you wanted to say that we haven't touched on? Uh, no, just thank you once again for coming along and, and speaking and happy to pick up on the long-term work and capital work, etc., in, in future conversations. Okay, well, if I can thank you all for taking part and for your clear uh, answers.